see each other. Who left you stay in your quarantine space while we draw? Welcome to episode 21 of Quarantine. I'm Peter Hirschberg, and if you've been following us, uh, you've noted that this is an experiment that we've been doing uh, for over 10 weeks now. And, and, and at the very beginning, we were interested in exactly what was happening in this lockdown. How were we changing our lives in this moment of quarantine? And then we kind of moved through this phase where we were interested in uh, how would the world be different? We started looking at what was going on with cities, what might be going on uh, in communications media. Last episode, uh, we started thinking about how do we come together in collaboration for the world of tomorrow? What gets built next? Well, that's a big theme of today's show. And we have a wonderful group of people. We really want to get into how is place going to change? Uh, there's all this conversation about, uh, well, are we going to be going back to office buildings and which cities will will win or lose. Uh, tech companies are telling us that a lot of people are going to stay at home and how much staying at home would significantly change the way that we, we look at things. Design becomes a very important issue. Uh, we have new technologies. We're virtual. We're real. What does that look like? Uh, and then how might this be an advantage for our heartland cities? Okay, well, today we have an amazing group of people to help us think that through. So I think we should just bring them all on now. First of all, here's my host, uh, Mickey McManus. Hello, Mick. Hey, Peter. Okay, and and you will be bringing with us today our Miro whiteboard, which is our memory of the last twenty episodes, and a record yeah. where we're headed. Yeah, this is what we're working on today: um, a sense of place, Zoom towns, boom towns, or more. Um, and but if we if we kind of scroll a little bit back, it's an infinite board, so we're kind of we're kind of far out. When I'm lucky to be able to get the scroller to work. Um, we can take a look at a, an episode a little while ago. This was with Steve Jurvetson and Andrew Hessel, Synthetic Bowsers, talking about building foundries. Um, and we can go back and kind of see it and, and get a sense of things and, and be able to kind of kind of pull in and pull out and understand what's going on. Um, and and uh, we're just playing around with it. Anybody can, can uh, go on to our Miro board and comment or even help us draw. Uh, this is a collaborative infinite whiteboard, and uh, and we'll we'll post the links in the comments, and it's also on our home site. There's just a little area that says Miro, and if you click on it, you can you can join and draw along. Um, but it's just an experiment in trying to get collaborative cognition going on complex things. Excellent. On today's show, we're going to have Jeremiah Owing. Hello, Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is coming to us from his studio in his Airstream tractor trailer. Uh, Jeremiah, we're going to come back to you in a moment. You are a top industry analyst. We've known each other for years, and you've been having a conversation with Silicon Valley about the future of this industry. Yes, and thinking about what does the meaning of cities versus urbanization, hubs and spokes. I look forward to getting into it. And also with us today is Ashley Arndt. She was the creative director of Amazon Go, which was the retail store with a great deal of automation, including no cash registers, and also has been leading a lot of innovation at Microsoft. Welcome. Thank uh, you so much. You have been doing so much work at the confluence of space and design and new technology, and it looks like this is a moment that suddenly that kind of design thinking will help us understand cities and space. I certainly hope so. Um, it is a very exciting time. This opportunity for dis digital and physical integration um, might have seemed more kind of discretionary or optional. I think it's quickly becoming imperative and necessary. Um, so delighted to be here with you today. You know, so and Ashley is now a part of uh, a part of BCG Smart Environments uh, office. So she uh, has, has now started to look at a, a whole bunch of different organizations trying to figure this out and the bound boundaries between digital spaces and physical places, which I think is going to be really part of the topic here. How do we put people first? And Ashley is an experienced designer, so I think it's really important for us to remember the human dimension on all this. Absolutely. A, a thing we've seen over and over in this show is the future, which was supposed to be 10 or 15 years out, like showed up, right? Okay, so excited to get into that. And then joining us 
our good friend, James Fallows. Hello, Jim. Hi, Peter. Great to talk with you. And Mickey, I'm here from Washington, D.C., so I'll hope to, to bring a different kind of ethic than the civic spirit that is surrounding me at this instant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, more. <laughs> and also, we often get co caught up in our West Coast innovation-ness. It's <laughs> nice to have the establishment and the rest of the country check in with us. And you, you have really, you have kind of been... Um, our man in the rest of the country. Your career was about being a foreign correspondent and then the foreign country you came to was America's heartland. Yes, uh, my wife Deb and I, as we've discussed in the past, have been traveling for years and years through smaller cities. We actually spent much of last year making a movie with HBO based on our book, mm. Our Towns, which will be out later this year. So wow. we hadn't been in, I hadn't been in DC for a long time, but now I've been no place else for the last three months. Mm. Okay, so we're gonna turn to you is this America's heartland moment? Uh, as, as we hear about tech dispersal. Is the, does this get picked up by secondary cities? Or are there devastating issues there? So we look forward to getting into all of that. What a great show today. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Jeremiah, let's, let's start with you. Um, Sounds good. You, you, you know, you're always in conversation with Silicon Valley, and you had a very interesting Twitter post last week in which you challenged people to... Uh, to this poll, which we could put up. You asked, yeah. if you took a pay cut, would you take that in return for staying home? And, and the answer seemed to be a resounding yes. Tell us about that. It was really interesting. I, so first of all, this is not scientific, but I do scientific research surveys, but I use Twitter just to kind of sense the network. Uh, obviously I'm attracting business folks, tech folks. And, and essentially I asked them, what, if you could stay home and work from home for the rest of your career, um, as we saw Twitter announce that capability, would you do so if you could take a 10% pay cut? And of course, there's lots of reasons why people might do that because you could move to a bigger house out in the suburbs, or uh, you could do an ROI cost benefit analysis and commuting every day could equate to more than 10%. And so the findings were that 44% of the respondents said they would take that deal and work from home on a consistent basis going forward. And so that was um, a big thing to see. Yeah, and so how, you know, big, how big of a survey was this? How many people? I don't know. Can we pull that up? I think uh, uh, one of them was like um, 700 or something. You know, is yeah. over 500. Uh, I I do polls on a frequent basis, and here you know, we have 717 votes. Yeah, and um, um, okay, and this of course was going on right at the same time, right? That, that Mark Zuckerberg was saying, oh, we're going to be dispersing people, and you'll be taking a pay cut. Pay cut. That's right. And that, that happened at that point. And at, at the same time, there are there's a debate whether or not people are more productive or less productive. I've, do, I've done polls on that while they work at home. Um, and now, the interesting thing on this poll also, I also have it open, is 31%. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, you know, did this motion. No, you, you take that. I'm not taking that deal. I'm out of here. I'm going to find another job. Were they just saying that in spite because of the news cycle was so nasty around people potentially having a reduction in pay when they move to different areas? So the way that it was announced from Mark Zuckerberg is on January 1st, 2021, they will change comp based upon where location is. And this really upset people. People were saying, I'm working more hours at home. I am just as valuable, if not more valuable. You don't have to pay for office space. I'm taking that cost in, in my own house, increased electricity. You should pay me more. But a cost of living adjustment called COLA isn't a new thing at all. This is a normal thing. But here's where it got sticky and where technology comes into this. Um, he said that we will actually look at your IP address on an occasional basis, but it's you know based on trust, of course, but just to see where you really are in the world. So there was a lot of heat in this discussion. Of course, this triggers other things around where will people live. The last thing is that uh, about a quarter of these folks said, you know what, I will continue to go into the office. Um, and the, the assumption is that you would keep that same amount of pay, that 10%. So that's the interesting findings. I think it's directionally correct. I, I do think there was some knee-jerk reactions with, I'll seek another job. Do you really think one-third of people will say no over 10%? I don't know. So that's where it is. So one of the questions this raises is winners. And by the way, Mickey, generally at this point in the conversation when we were talking yesterday, you came in with a moral question about whether this pay cut thing might be good because it balances things out across America 
or in fact, it's just another form of extractive capitalism because they're just, okay, here, the same work's getting done, they're paying people less, and it's going, it's concentrating. Well, yeah, no, I do think there's an interesting um, uh, thing here. First, we also have value falsification, what people, what people say they do and what they actually do or what they actually need or what they actually value aren't necessarily the same thing, what people say in a poll and versus what they actually are re rewarded by or feel a, a sense of well-being from. And um, and so I, I don't know yet what's really going to happen, but I, I just was saying, in some ways, I wonder, okay, great, um, you're going to take a pay cut and you're going to uh, go populate a whole bunch of the second tier towns and all that. Is that going to actually be able to raise those towns up or is in, you know create new boom towns that are Zoom towns because everybody's disconnected? Uh, and they look for great places with high internet connectivity or something. Um, uh, or will it really just be another way to kind of get more people to work at less and less value? You know, um, and, and we saw some of those things happen with uh, with sort of um, offsetting people so that they were contractors than, than really employees. They lost their collective ability to do things um, because they were considered contractors. They were gig workers or something. And it didn't and it may not have been powerful in all those different ways, although I'm not the expert on any of this stuff. I think, in fact, um, Jeremiah has done some uh, fascinating work on, I mean, uh, the on question, cloud Jeremiah. companies as well. You know, it's a complicated question. Thanks. So we launched we launched into the gig economy thing and thought it'd be great, and there were unintended consequences. So, thoughts here? Yeah. Yes. So I think we will see many salaries on the coast. People that are based on the coast now, their salaries over the next few years will decrease because now you're opening up to globalization, or at least national-based uh, um, workers and, and folks are going to distribute. We're going to move away from the coastal hubs. I mean, Amazon already has three headquarters, right? So we're going to move away from the coastal hubs like Silicon Valley and Seattle and New York. And we're going to spread into a hub and spoke model where we'll, we will see people um, disperse and we will see the wages in the Midwest, in the South, uh, potentially rise and in the Rockies and of course home values well. So we will see this dispersion that we've been craving in America. This has been the rallying discussion um, for some of the democratic candidates already to equalize um, the income and, and wealth across the country. So I think this will happen. And, and this is potentially a good thing. Yeah, and I think what's interesting about this, so you know, I was talking yesterday to some real estate investors in San Diego doing really interesting things. And their whole thesis was, here's why things are bad, but it's gonna be great for us in San Diego. And Riaz today posted something about Oakland in which he talked about a lot of the changes we go through, but why it'd be good for Oakland. And um, and we have a clip coming up uh, with Kevin O'Leary explaining why it's going to be for his companies. So, But one thing you do not hear is a lot of people talking about why downtown San Francisco real estate will be good. So there seems to be a growing opinion that uh, all of the headquarters that had to come here for established companies, you can start moving that stuff out. Mm -hmm. uh what what what's the buzz that you're hearing in, in in fact why don't we put up the facebook post you you post a lot of these thoughts on facebook sure. and then you have comments what's the buzz around silicon valley on san francisco what's going to happen yes yeah, so it'll still remain this hive epicenter of and you know the the natural collisions that happen from innovation discussions will continue to stay in silicon valley some of the core roles include the vcs and the c-suite of the tech companies they have their family situated here they're not going to leave however um they will maintain their leadership ranks they will still stay here in silicon valley but and the product leadership as well However, the rest of the roles don't need to be based here. They could be based um, in other regions. So I, I thought about there was four different potential regions. So the first region would be San Francisco, Santa Clara County, and then San Mateo County. The second region would be the other seven counties, uh, including Alameda and um, all the rounds around the, the Bay, Bay Area. And then the third region would be all those that are touching those different regions, including um, even up to Sacramento. And so, and those folks might come into the office twice a week and they may make a commute for 90 minutes to 120 minutes one way, but they're not coming in that often. So it's not as painful or they may not come in at all. And, and then of course the fourth region is San Diego, Colorado, Denver, um, Austin, where they fly in once or twice a month and it's not a, an issue. So I think that is what is going to happen. So let's, let's first talk about um, Market Street where there are many tech companies. Those those communities will suffer because Twitter has said that people can work at home indefin indefinitely. 
uh, and they are propping up that uh, mid-market area and they have deals with the government to bolster that local communi community. So that's a risk point. And I do have concerns around what that means for that part of the community. So there's gonna be lots of macroeconomic changes and micro. Um, if you look at the comments on my Facebook feed, you'll see many of the digital digital body in Silicon Valley from VCs to people working at the big tech companies all were chiming in and I could hear the different voices. Uh, but I think the voice that is most interesting is my realtor. She opened up her, her swath of properties to be 90 minutes outside uh, from touching the water, the bay. Uh, it used to be only 30 minutes or so. So mm. that's a real indicator to me. This mm. is really a description of a regional economy writ large. Uh, this is, I don't know if you know Patrick McKenna, who has been, you know, doing a lot of work on how do we do heartland investments. But one of the things you see, you, you know, you started seeing Sacramento or Reno or, 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 or even Salt Lake. It's, it, it's, it's, uh, it is Seattle and San Francisco spreading out. And arguably this is really good news. And I think we'll talk about that with, with, with Jim Fallows a little bit later. Um, and the, the, uh, and, and likewise, that creates a really interesting uh, situation for San Francisco. Do we have that uh, San Francisco Chronicle article that we can put up? The Chronicle had a piece this morning about why this might be bad news for San Francisco. And on the same day, uh, several new office towers were, were, were approved to go up on, uh, on, on Market Street. I have a question. Well, that, that, there we go. Pandemic casts a shadow in the future of real estate here. Um, one of the questions that, that comes up here you know, this this whole bit about the density of cities where innovation happens. If we go back in time to 1993, to the dawn of the Internet, um, George Gilder, who's another who was kind of the Jeremiah Owing of his day, you know, industry analyst, tech person, was saying we won't have cities because everybody will work at home. And of course, what we what we learned was um, as we moved to an information economy, there was a premium on people coming together and creating things. And then, you know, less expensive in cloud computing meant open innovation and APIs and Web 2.0. And suddenly it was people crammed together in cities that was the premium of having new ideas. So I could get that when Twitter gets expensive, it's just cheaper to send people home because the core innovation happened. The teams are together. But when it comes to founding and starting things and that innovation thing, does that happen in secondary cities or do we still need our dense places for that? I'm hearing many stories of startups still up, young startups still operating in a, in a virtual model. But the question is, how did they meet? How did they catalyze? And yeah. I think that's a, a really good question. Mm. Those collisions still need to happen. Um, are yeah. they in meet space? Are they in physical space? And they're also augmented digitally. I think it's a combination. I, I, I don't really know what this looks like. I definitely see the VCs um, hosting their own ch uh, online chats, trying to reach out to the entrepreneurs and trying to catalyze those conversations. Um, I, I really don't know. Well, and I wonder. Um, uh, I wonder in some of this stuff if, if uh, the emergency, you know, that we're in this emergency, um, is matching to the to the sort of pace layer, the time horizon that it takes to build property, the time horizon it takes to build teams, the time horizon it, you know, and if the emergency kind of thinking where we're all feeling crazy levels of stress and we're trying to look at the good stuff, we're having probably more intimate conversations with each other, senior leaders and teams and and prospects if you're trying to figure out, you know, working with a new group or something than ever before in some ways, um, because you're seeing everyone's whole life in front of them because the work-life balance, the contract has been kind of shredded um, where you're at and, and, and where your family's at and where your kids are at and things. Um, and I just wonder how much of the reaction that right now will last 10 years from now? Um, you know, in other words, real estate time or 50 years from now in terms of um, infrastructure time uh, and and how much of that will be something we look back on and go why 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 did we do that you know why didn't we just figure out how to be back together again because we love being together and we know that cities seem to have a fractal model to them that end up being far more efficient for the planet far more environmentally friendly than 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 dispersed populations so you know there's a whole weird set of things here I think a big part of the thing I worry about with new startups and new things is Yes, if it's all digital, uh, you know, a bunch of people can work at home. And if all the digital players of the last generation, the Twitters and the whatevers, are saying, hey, I can do it all from home, it's because they built the thing and it's all mostly software. But in the future, a lot more of the technologies are going to be intelligence at the edges. It's going to be things that engage the physical space. It's going to be things that help us understand the values of the real world and the physical world, you know, the sort of Internet of Things stuff. 
And how do you even do Internet of Things startups when you can't you can't go and deploy rough prototypes in real people's homes easily, and you can't you know uh, test this stuff at large? I, I think it's just it's wrapped up with a whole bunch of interesting questions, and I don't quite know where, if we're getting the the human component to this. We're getting the kind of I'm strong enough and I can do this. Why can't you do this? And then I think of all the people who literally have to be outside to pick up the garbage or to to deliver mail or do important services for community-based or location-based things for nonprofits and things like that. I mean, a little um, bit of what we're saying here, though, Mick, is we're not saying we'll all go virtual. I think a lot of what we're saying is we're going to go to other cities, right? So some people, some of the Twitter employees will be home. But part of what you're saying, Jeremiah, is this is good for the areas that are two or three hours out of San Francisco. No longer do they have to suffer the two-hour yeah. commute. Yeah. They get to I, live and there. I think that's, I love that point. Yeah, that's no. a good thing. Uh, but I also think your your point in general is if you can actually find the right talent yeah. anywhere in the world and feel comfortable saying, I'll hire you, then we might have cognitive diversity, right? We might have gender diversity. We might have cognitive diversity. We might have age diversity, cultural diversity. You know, that whole thing that would actually help you be more hybrid, you know, sort of have a hybrid vigor that's where, right. where you could actually be a more resilient organization. I mean, that's so what I, a network is too, right? We're, we're shifting yeah. away from a hub to this, you know, it's a tessellation as it, as it spreads yeah. and, and, and diverts out. And I think that is the, the direction that we should be heading. I think those are all yeah. good things. Yeah. Um, Interesting. <clears throat> I want to, um, did I cut you off? If not, I want no, to show something. Okay. Yeah. So to get a, to get a non Silicon Valley perspective on all this, here's a clip from Kevin O'Leary of shark time, shark, shark tank fame in which he was asked about what would the effect of this be on the profitability of his heartland companies. Let's take a look. America 2.0 that's much more efficient in how it runs its businesses because across our portfolio, we're going to offer about 20% of our employees the right to work at home perpetually, um, particularly in areas like compliance, accounting, logistics. If they wish not to commute anymore, we're agreeing to upgrade their internet. Uh, we're going to provide them with equipment that they can stay at home and, and do their jobs. And what I find so incredible, we're getting people working 10 hours a day right now at home more than we're asking them to because they don't have anything else to do and our productivity has gone through the roof all at the expense of, of the landlord and that that sector i think is going to have some significant challenges because we're going to reduce our square footage probably by 20 percent and we think don't know this yet but i think we can save five to seven percent this is such a All right. Okay. So essentially, here here were Heartland companies saying they could save five or seven percent, uh, both because they're sending people home and they're closing retail locations. So I thought that was that was kind of telling. Um, you know, Peter. Another thing that he mentioned though, and I, I'd, I'd like Jeremiah's take on this. He mentioned people are working ten-hour days, so productivity is through the roof, and the people suffering are landlords. I was thinking about their families. I was thinking about whatever happened to us having a four-day week or a three-day week in the 20th first century and actually having more time to live instead of you know live to work. And then I was also wondering, uh, the, on the positive side, his comment about equipment at home, right? It, it, I think there's a separate kind of real estate deal here, though, which is how do you help people set up genuinely collaborative home offices that don't you know, I, I noticed you happen to be in a in a in a beautiful sort of uh, micro home office from the 1930s all the way to today, the Airstream. Uh, so, what's your take on this kind of stuff? Will people get care packages to actually have a better experience wherever they are? That, yeah. that brings that with or what? Mm -hmm. I I have been asking folks, and as you might imagine, I I constantly asking the market. So I do ask folks on, on Twitter, mm -hmm. and I, I did do this one yesterday. What do you need to be successful at home? And then I tallied up the responses. Mm -hmm. The most mm -hmm. commonly said thing was the devices they needed, uh, internet, second screens, a uh, fast laptop. People were not ready. They did mm -hmm. not have the hardware uh, to be successful. The second thing that people said, <clears throat> and this one shocked me. Um, I was surprised. It was around discipline and motivation. Mm. It was around the mental yeah. focus and resilience to make this happen. 
Uh, and so the third, uh, another time I've asked folks, um, and I said, be honest, because I can't see who you are in responding. Are you more productive working at, working from home during this quarantine period or less? And around, I think 30% of people said they were less productive, whether it's yeah. childcare or dogs or just the stress or maybe somebody's sick in their life, um, all of those things. So it, working from home does not guarantee that you will be successful in doing it. I think people need to be prepared and um, HR needs to be ready to support them and even fund this with new types of expenses. Mm -hmm. And also the way that you manage people and support them, and they're not near people, they're not near the water cooler conversations. That could have an, an emotional toll. We know it's important for us to connect to people. Uh, so that that's an important part of the community aspect. I think I love this comment. You know, I just was talking to some senior leaders at a very big company, and they were saying um, they feel like they really don't know how their teams are feeling when they're not on on live. Because at the water cooler, they were able to kind of see the person just sort of like casually reading a book or just like holding their head while they're sitting there waiting for the coffee or, you know, all these things that we are as humans were built over three billion years of life on Earth to like sense this richness and be off camera so that we could we could just be but also be casually together and there's no i'm feeling lucky button on zoom that i could wander through some other teams there's no casually fade in and out of zoom you know it's it's all right in your face there and are wonder, virtual worlds emerging just for enterprise and corporate uh, yeah. so i've seen at least three variants of that that i'm starting to dig into uh, and we will probably see more emoticons emerge on all of the collaboration tools to en enable that. Mm. And here's a funny thing. And I know this yeah. is a wild thing to say, but I think we're going to see an enterprise class TikTok where we're going to see employees oh, yeah. do weird oh, yeah. dance offs and things just so they can emote and self-express. Yeah. Anything that happens on the consumer side, we'll see replicate in the enterprise because they want people to, to fuse and bond. Nice. You mentioned that, um, the the people people want hardware like a bigger screen and things like that at home um and i noticed that for like saturday night live they ship them green screens you know so that they could actually have be put into virtual worlds together um there's a a, a few decades worth of study that actually just surface area of your screen surface area of your of your office space increases your cognition and capacity to deal with things because you're not always opening and closing things so Maybe this double down is 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 the need also to be able to have your brain not be overloaded, and and just be able to have two screens or three screens. We saw this even in the uh, in early days of logistics for dealing with uh, disasters. They'd have a screen to see the map and a screen to see where the problems were and a screen to see whatever. And keeping those, knowing I look left for this and right for that, allowed them not to have to shuffle all the time through tabs or you know all this. Which stuff. suggests that people might have dedicated rooms in their house uh, and they might yeah. move out of the, the hubs into a, a secondary or region two and might mm. find a house or an apartment with a dedicated room, which the employer mm. may pay for. Yeah. I mean, this, this if you remember <laughs> a few years ago, McMansions were big and then suddenly kitchen great rooms were, would be were right. big. It would certainly seem from a real estate perspective to go short on downtown office buildings and long on the cool home office with a green screen seems right. like and the amenity will want. So, and we might even see the, the garage convert because you may not need two cars. That's right. So imagine yeah. a pod slides into the garage. I mean, yeah. in a way, this is a modular office. This is an Airstream. This is by design. You can put it anywhere. So we'll see more of these types of things emerge as well. This is an excellent tee up to bring our next guest in and perhaps she can join us because what we're discussing now are these interfaces between the physical and the virtual and how do we design for environments that have technology that understands what's going on. So why don't we welcome uh, Ashley to the to these microphones and uh, Mick, I'm going to let you lead off with this because you guys have both worked yeah. together and have spent time designing for these environments. Yeah. So Ashley um Actually, I, I want to I want to touch on a few things that that we we were talking about the other day. Um, in a sense, you worked on the Amazon Go store, and for people who've never experienced this, it's a it's basically almost a robot that you go into, that is sensing everything about you, um, and you just walk into this physical location to buy some stuff. Um, you walk through a little thing with your phone, and you already have an Amazon account, and you just grab whatever you feel like, toss it in a bag, and you walk out. And it feels almost like you're you're stealing something a little bit, or you're like, oh, you know. And it's a weird thing, but I did it the first time in the in the one that, that you actually prototyped over and over again for three years up in Seattle, and and the first time I was like, okay, this is a gimmick, 
And then like later that week, I walked in there like six times because I was just like, I wandered in, I picked up some stuff, I wandered out and it felt better and better. And it was a, we it was a weird situation. It's also kind of, it just felt like, of course you should know me by now. Every damn thing has all this stuff. So talk a little bit about the process just to get us into what you mean when you take an experience, a human centered design look at designing something like that. What like what were the weird things that you discovered that if somebody really tried to weave intelligence and ambient intelligence right into a physical space, what happened? Um, so many weird things. Um, and I'll, I'll start out with just one of the really basic ones. Um, the complexion of the team that did this work was really weird. Um, <clears throat> never, never before assembled, I guess, is maybe a, a more polite way to refer to it. Um, but working with computer vision scientists, um, <clears throat> um, uh, industrial design, physical architecture, software architecture, um, and researchers um, to understand, you know, what what does it mean to create um, a completely new to the world experience that, to your point about kind of shoplifting, really challenges your expectations about what you're supposed to be doing in physical space. Um, <clears throat> what I would tell you is, um, yes. Well, Ashley, you also mentioned that it wasn't only that you're you're flesh you're fleshing out this complexion. You had. You had architects, brick and mortar architects and retail, retail merchandisers and people and brand people, you know, so it was all this kind of intersection of different paces and hardware and software and stuff. So I just want to make sure everyone gets that. And For sure. Um, it, it challenged, I think every expectation any one of those individual professions might have might have brought to the table. Um, we didn't even have the right vocabularies to talk about this stuff together. So there was a there was an approach um, that that I learned there that I've absolutely taken with me um, to every other situation I've been in, which is show, don't tell. Um, the need to kind of experiment together and roll up your sleeves and actually figure this stuff out um, in sort of tangible fashion, you know, whether it be space shaping or actually getting the materials and finishes um, <clears throat> in view of the cameras to see if it freaks the technology out. Um, we used to talk about breaking the store and, <clears throat> you know, very simple things that you would completely take for granted, um, wouldn't even think about the the level of sheen, for example, um, on the, the floor could break the store um, if if it was, in you know, too shiny or use the wrong cleaning agents. Um, so it was, you know, it was actually, I would say, beyond invention, or excuse me, beyond innovation and actually pure play invention. Um, like the sheen on something made a difference. Like, give everyone a real tangible example. We what, have a what do you mean? we have a clip of yeah, the Amazon. Let's go let's go I want to I want to understand what you mean by the sheen problem. Of course, like, just as a gritty detail. Before you play the clip, um, yeah, just go ahead and do that. Sure. We all um, do all the time. There, there is, um, there are a couple of things that are really problematic for for computer vision technologies. So imagine these um, infrared cameras, depth cameras, that are looking into space and understanding everything within that field. And um, you know, <clears throat> I as an individual don't have a whole lot of what we refer to as IR reflectivity. I'm not bouncing back a lot of um, infrared light at the camera. If I did, I would actually disappear. Um, and we found, you know. Um, fixturing, um, the paint on the fixtures actually had a certain amount of IR reflectivity and where the camera might have seen one person, either they might mysteriously disappear um, from view or maybe two people would show up because um, because they were getting some sort of interesting shadow image. So, you know, things that were unknown unknowns prior to, to the testing that we did together. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, contactless retail is obviously a um, again, one of those things that has become much more imperative um, as a point of consideration inside major retailers. And I think the the unfortunate thing is um, it's hard. Um, you know, some years have passed now. It's less hard. Um, but when we imagine that that somehow we'll just roll in a few a few cameras and achieve something um, as as transformative in terms of its experience as Amazon Go, um, that that simply isn't true. Um, you know, it's early enough um, in this physical digital integration. Um, that that deep experimentation is required. Mm. Um, the project was was in the works for four years before we opened the first store, and that's because it was hard, um, mm. and it continues to be um, challenging. Albeit, you know, we're we're aggressively um, beginning to to um, be able to accomplish things that at that point in time, um, you know, the store opened. Um, over three years ago now, um, <clears throat> were, were truly bleeding edge. I would still say it's very leading edge technology, um, but we have, we have a long way to go. 
Um, and then there's just you know organizational complexity too, uh, making sure that you have the IT infrastructure to support something that actually consumes that much data. Um, they they are um, they are data intensive. Um, basically <clears throat> systems of record. Um, they take a lot more mm. energy um, than a typical grocery store does too. So lots of attendant complexity um, with beginning to mm. achieve these sorts of things that as we know, become simpler and more cost-effective over time. But it takes it takes those sort of forays into the unknown um, with the multidisciplinary team um, to begin to, to make it um, more attainable for, for, you know, kind of the not Amazons of the world, I guess I should say. So let's run the clip. In this okay. stuff. Well, just so a quick question. Now I've got a question. Are you seeing an uptick <laughs> of interest in this from other retailers that COVID accelerated because of contactless? Oh my goodness, yes. Um, you know, so much of what happens, um, not just in the retail environment, but in the workplace environment, you know, it's it's absolutely part of that conversation too, has to do with how close I'm willing to stand to you, how many people are allowed in a given space, and what I'm willing to touch. So contactless as a as a basic driver, you know, everything I, <laughs> I had the the initially kind of strange experience of actually having someone spray my credit card with Lysol before they handed yeah. it back to me. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. our hyper awareness of what we touch um, and what we're willing to either release from our personal possession or what we're engaging with, um, I think has has the majority of major retailers actually doing some pretty low hanging fruit. Um, and thankfully um, that's the case around contactless payment. Um, but you can begin to see the same sorts of technologies that make that possible, begin to make a lot of other things possible yeah. so that you can really minimize the contact and be much more thoughtful about communicating to people in the space about, about their health and safety. But also the space is, knows it, about possibly in the future could be kind of a micro radar network to actually know that just aisle five or those things over there, like don't do that right now. Or even tell me, oh, somebody pick that up and put it back. You know, and I that I would be aware of this, right? So when the space is aware and can shape my experience, it makes something very different happen. I want to roll the clip now because Peter Let's was asking it. for it. And then I want to go back to system of record because I think there's something about ethics and uh, ambient intelligence that, that suddenly you ran right into. And uh, yes. let's talk about that after we see the clip. Wonderful. Four years ago, we started to wonder, what would shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go? What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like, anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. So how does it work? We used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion, much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it Just Walk Out Technology. Self-driving stores, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was the best analogy, you know, for the time, um, and yeah. and it's actually true. It's it's computer vision, um, real time computer vision. So with depth perception, and um, that that's absolutely the the same sorts of technology. Um, well, and two reflections of me, and it sounds what like one problem. You know, do you know if I'm staying there? But two reflections of the thing I bought. Are you going to bail me twice? You know, so so that sounds like real subtle details that as an architect or an engineer, you might not have ever thought of when the space can pay attention to you. No doubt. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, one of the other things that I would like to, to kind of assert, um, <clears throat> this technology is obviously super transferable from a retail environment. The reason I think, um, um, and this is upon reflection after after being gone for a while. The reason I think that we um, we pursued the retail proposition is is 
honestly, the the data collect opportunity um, and, you know, a high volume environment where you can actually pressure test um, the resiliency of the technology and get the right types of data, um, <clears throat> you know, ensure that that the cameras are appropriately recognizing um, different skin tones, for example. Um, there, there again, are so many unknown unknowns um, that <clears throat> that we needed a beta um, situation. And obviously the concept is rolling out incrementally um, across the United States, um, somewhat slowly, but the the level of sophistication and the education, um, quite frankly, of the algorithms behind the proposition um, were accelerated by the fact that it is this retail thing that has a lot of traffic. Um, so when you think about it, grocery being your most frequent retail shopping trip, it was the perfect place to to um, to begin to experiment with these sorts of techs. So um, I am excited um, for the continued improvement of these systems and the the uh, ongoing presence of them in our lives because it truly is, you know, you felt like you were going um, shoplifting, but it also is quite magical and you can begin yeah. to create net new interactions that frankly hadn't existed before. Yeah. That I want to stop you. Yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. I mean, finish your sentence, but I want to jump in there because I thought you just said something amazing that I want to drill in on. It just, um, with, with, you know, great power comes great responsibility. I think, um, I think it's critically important as we begin to imagine these, these new use cases, um, that we're being really sensitive about the people that they're intended, um, to, to serve mm -hmm. that the, the actual users, um, um, are, are top of mind um, because it is it is absolutely true. Um, I'll, I'll share another analogy actually from, from more of a Microsoft day. Um, um, back to the idea of IR reflectivity. And I mentioned that I don't have a whole lot of IR reflectivity. Um, certain ethnicities, um, especially with certain hair textures actually have a lot of IR absorption. And, you know, if, if we are not thoughtful, if we are not um, ethically appropriate or um, really unbiased in um, participation of, of people in the development of these systems, we will inadvertently create, um, frankly, racist um, technologies. And it's not, it's not as if anybody um, had ever obviously intended to do anything like that. It's simply by virtue of not being thoughtful um, of the inherent risks um, mm. of, of developing this sort of stuff. So um, that's one of the things that, that I absolutely champion in all of the casework that I do. Um, yes, let's create these new things that have never existed before, but let's please, please simultaneously understand kind of the, the more dystopian um, potential futures of this and, and actively work to avoid them in real time rather than trying to fix something later. Hmm. I, so this ties perfectly to what you said in your last part, which I'm sitting here just trying to draw while you were talking. And um, who do we serve? And putting people first, right? Which which is not what you hear often in in tech circles. Sometimes it's MVP, you know, and viable doesn't usually mean viable for the human. It means viable for your back end or something like that. It doesn't mean delightful or magically. It's not like M M M P or you know minimum magical product. But <laughs> your store feels magical and. And, and I know the continued exploration of kind of just ethical ambient intelligence or how do we think about that? Um, but you also said something, you know, by having this retail experience, you could teach the store. And I, I just, that stuck in my head because I'm like, are we going to raise racist stores? Are we going to raise racist buildings? Are we going to raise oppressive ones that make lucky people luckier? As we heard in from Kathy O'Neill, are we going to actually help unlucky people be luckier because they've already been marginalized and are we going to actually help level this stuff? And and can the technology kind of um, be be raised like we try to raise our kids, you know, as good citizens and and as people who that. are open to that? So it just it sounds it sounds powerful when we really say this. Can you drill in more on on, on ambient intelligence and why at Microsoft you were actually part of a team that had to do with ambient intelligence and ethics? Yes, um, <clears throat> that that was one of the the most wonderful things I think about my Microsoft experience there. Um, and um, for those of you that that are aware of such things, you know, Microsoft I think among um, all the tech giants is probably doing the the best job um, of of really articulating a point of view and championing um, ethical emerging technology development. Um, Brad Smith, the president, um, just wrote a, a book recently called. Um, tools and weapons, um, you know, to kind of indicate the the fact that you know, an invention can actually be pointed a bunch of different places. Um, I know 
you know, a, a lot of engineers, God love them. I love my engineering partners. Um, you know, I just want to invent the thing. And then what happens with the thing is incumbent on the the goodness of people um, to ensure that it happens the right way. And I, I don't disagree with that, but I, I absolutely think that we are, we are um, responsible to our inventions too. I mean, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people, uh, forgive me, it's a, it's a potentially or difficult, um, um, analogy, especially in a week like the one we've had this week, but I mean, people say guns don't kill people, people kill people. But what I would actually say is, from a from an object, you know, the gun is inherently more prone to misuse than, for example, a roll of toilet paper. So <clears throat> we um, we can't avoid our commitment as the inventors of these things to again really be thoughtful about what could go wrong. Um, a dear friend of mine who is a um, a visiting professor at the University of Washington is actually leading a uh, course on design noir. Um, and I don't believe he calls it that. I apologize. I, I think he'd be mortified to hear me refer to it. But challenging his UX design students as they imagine, um, you know, new technologies to actively design um, a noir scenario for it so that they can begin to figure out how to create um, a topically um, appropriate thing, a vaccine um, for it in real time. So they're not just mm. delivering a cure, but they're they're delivering, um, or they're not just delivering an object, but they're delivering a vaccination um, against its misuse. Mm. Um, well, and I, and so you said uh, just you said this notion of and, and design noir is is fascinating in itself. Like a lot of times, people do scenario planning, and it's easy for, to be dystopian, um, but we also don't think of like, um, okay, what if this thing scaled up and became a movement? What if this thing uh, actually became uh, uh, taken over by a megalomaniac, a, a Bond villain? Uh, what if somebody was like, you know, the people who actually do capers on those Bond villains? How, how could that do it? So it's a great frame. You were saying even though that when you start doing ambient intelligence, you're getting bio, you're getting all sorts of weird signals that maybe the person themselves don't even know about themselves. And the question is, it's not like they, how where, how do they even say that's okay? How do they feel sovereign about the fact Absolutely. that you're able to know that I'm a little warm today and I might be actually predictably about to have some kind of a a bad thing happen to me or God knows what, right? Well, I mean, so so let's just take a page out of the current news. Um, you know, taking one's temperature prior to being able to engage in a physical space or to be allowed admittance. Um, it's a pretty short walk to something, at least, you know, in our current mind frame seems like, oh, that's to keep me safe. It's a pretty mm -hmm. short walk. Um, and again, you know, I think, I think it's so fascinating because our, our experience and our opinions are so new with this entire situation. I think, I think it's mm -hmm. dangerous to presume how we feel now is how we're going to continue to feel. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm pretty quickly, I think, um, going to, to be in a space where my temperature is frankly, none of your business. Um, you know, unless, unless there there, there are aspects of um, of the pandemic that continue to manif manifest in really wow. um, unfortunate ways. So short walk from from biometric capture and biometric data to biometric surveillance. Um, yeah. And, and well, I think you know, not only temperature, maybe you know, really like my gait, out. my walk, you know, all these things that might imply a whole bunch of other things too. Yeah, um, something this really points out is the degree to which things that go on in the tech industry suddenly have become core to both policy and to ethics and to governance. And I remember when I came out and was working for Apple in the 1980s, the tech, we thought we were changing the world, but the rest of the country just figured we were something on the West Coast making PCs and it was fine, right? And it was really around the year 2000 and the invention of social media that suddenly all of this online stuff did change the world because people could be slut shamed or their identities could be held. And then we were eliminating jobs. And now we come to this moment, I mean, as current as this morning with the president and Trump, where kind of our fundamental constitutional issues of how we both protect ourselves, the first and second amendment are being played out in the digital sphere. Hmm. Okay, that's a setup for the fact that when we talk about these broad warp and woof issues in America, we turn to James Fallows. That was a transition there, but I want to bring everybody back. Uh, but but Jim, if we if we go back to the kind of the dawn of the modern tech industry, you were in Washington. You were uh, working for Jimmy Carter, writing his speeches when when this was not a set of issues. Fast forward to your journey. Um, you spent the last many years in America's heartland, reporting on how it can be hopeful. 
But then your reporting in the last couple of months have pointed out that because we've had a fumbled federal response, we really need state and local. And then you wrote that kind of piece about Erie, Pennsylvania, which had yeah. so many of our hopes, and then a lot of it undone in weeks. So kind of what are you seeing about Heartland response and where does it fit now? So, uh, Peter, thanks very much. So there's a been a over the last couple of years, as I've discussed with with both of you, um, the message that my wife, Deb, and I were, were making was that at a time when people were sort of increasingly dissatisfied with federal level governance in the United States, you know, regardless of their political point of view, it seemed to be gridlocked and not going any place. There was this kind of um, renaissance going on in many cities around the country and many state governments, many regional organizations. And this is what something we we're making more and more forcefully as a case. There's been a sort of horrible illustration of that in the last couple of months, a, a an illustration with two sides to it. The, 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 the bleakly promising part has been that a time of, of historic failure in federal response for, from my point of view, where I think the federal government has done as badly in dealing with this pandemic as it's done on any big issue in, in my, my lifetime. We've seen mayors around the country taking a lead and governors of both political parties and religious um, leaders and, uh, and, and business leaders from many groups finding what can we do for our region, uh, for our people to try to include people, especially those who are being hardest hit. We know that this disease is intensifying all the existing inequalities in American life. And so finding ways to, to overcome that, that's the bleakly positive point of view. We've seen a real illustration of local level resilience and the kind of fabric that, that exists in many parts of the U.S. The, the challenging part is that the institutions that have led this kind of revival in many smaller towns, you mentioned Erie, Pennsylvania, the same thing in Greenville, South Carolina, or Sioux Falls, South Dakota, or a million other places we've been, those are the ones that are really exposed to the pressure that that uh, the pandemic and the lockdown have placed on on smaller institutions, ones with thinner capital that don't maybe have the uh, the wherewithal to get even some of the uh, the subsidies that the government is offering. So you have the very institutions that have revived a lot of interior America being hardest hit right now, and that is the drama being played out in many many cities around the country. Yeah, there's an irony here because sometimes you turn on the news and you hear. Most of the pandemics in the cities, the cities aren't getting enough aid. It's pork going to the red states. And then, but when you dig into it, I, and I mean, this also gets into the innovation question. We're excited for Heartland, but it's really difficult. Um, uh, what, and on the whole, yeah. I'm trying to form a question here just because there's so much going, there's so much going on. Uh, tell us. So I, I, I'll, I'll volunteer an answer. How about that? I'll volunteer an answer. With, <laughs> I'm yeah, in D.C. Yeah. Thank where the approach is out. always give the answer you want to give, no matter what the question is. That's that's that's, exactly. that's, that's <laughs> perfect. That's the DC way. And I was thinking and yeah. hearing these, you know, the, these wonderful comments by uh, Jeremiah and Ashley about the kinds of things, um, a, a brighter side of a lot of places that are not right in the Bay Area and not right in Boston and not, not right in Seattle or or even Los Angeles, where they've always already been able to use some of the tools of dispersed working to build their own smaller versions of startup um, economies where they are. And I think that that uh, one of the side effects of the pandemic will be accelerating some of that, not too far from where all of you are, where, where many of you are, and certainly in the Bay Area is Fresno, uh, California, mm -hmm. where a now five or six year old startup called Bitwise has been really innovative in trying to create jobs for people in the Central Valley and spreading its model around the country. Um, in my hometown of Redlands, California, right near San Bernardino, there's a, an established company called Esri, E-S-R-I, which is a mapping company, which has transformed that town. There are illustrations I could give you from Dodge City, Kansas, and Duluth, Minnesota, and, and Sioux Falls, and other places. So I think that um, there is, there has been for a number of years, a version of the calculus you've been discussing so far, of people thinking, gee, I could work I could commute two and a half hours a day and pay all of my income for a tiny apartment in San Francisco or someplace in the Bay Area or LA, or I could come back home to Fort Wayne, Indiana, or I could come back to Allentown, Pennsylvania, and there are some tech opportunities I could take advantage of there. And I think we'll see somewhat more of that. You know, anything that's important and interesting is always contradictory 
So I think we'll continue to see concentration because that matters. But I think we will see this will be one more boost for a dispersal movement that that was beginning already. Hmm. I mean, Jim, you and I met at the at the Aspen Institute when you were just beginning your journey, and I was beginning writing the Maker City, yep. and we were we were actually in a. Uh, do you remember it was it was a conversation on social capital with uh, who was the political polling alone? Um, uh, Putnam, Robert Putnam. Yeah, Robert yes. Putnam was saying <laughs> social capital is going away in America, and we were arguing no, we see in the maker movement social capital and small town social capital. Fast forward, we write these books, and we saw this growing small business movement in, in, in local. Um, do you get the sense that? the tools or what's going on in this pandemic will spur um, the, what we love about urbanism, uh, you know, either density, more downtown stuff, uh, young people wanting to go to these things first, or is this more like big companies just putting secondary offices out there? I think probably both of those things. Again, um, we, we've discussed, <laughs> we've all of us have talked enough time over the years that you know my view on any question is all of the above. And yeah. so th th we're going to see that we're already we have seen some advantages to very big companies and having economies of scale in delivery or real estate or whatever. So I think we'll see more of that. But also, I think there are in quiet ways reflections going on in millions of households, tens of millions of households around the country about what it is they miss and value right now what kinds of things you really want to get uh, be, to be able to do again. There are things about an office that are good. There are things about offices which are just a chore and a pain. There are things about concerts and art museums and public places and parks and bars and, and restaurants and all the rest that people I think are more acutely aware of what they want to re recreate. So I think there's a kind of reset of what yeah. collective and civic activities we want to have again. Your your wife. I think, I think I want to jump in for a sec though. There there's a your book does a beautiful job because yeah, Deb has one chapter, you have another chapter, <laughs> and you almost look at it from a different point of view. As you're flying over in your small plane, and you see how many cars are in that factory parking lot, and you see whether anybody can come and get you if the plane's got a problem because you're a small thing. Um, but what you heard over and over again that I want you to just uh, play out a bit was just. Um, People from even smaller towns thinking about, yeah, someday I'm going to make it up to Sioux Falls or like and and also the embracing of immigrants in many cases, because in the local towns, it was like we need to get this done and we, we're, we're helping them or or in some cases, refugees in towns from other war torn areas of the world really being, you know, embraced. Let me thank you for for remembering and noticing those things. Now, let me just just touch on. Two of the points you raised, one is about immigrants and refugees. One of the very strongest impressions we had traveling around the country, basically from 2013 to early 2017, then we stopped to, to write this book and travel again last year, is that people in general thought immigration might be a problem for the U.S. out there. But where they were living, the places that were most at ease with immigration and ethnic change were the places where it was happening. The places, uh, you know, it's not a coincidence that the most anti-immigrant congressman and now is Steve King uh, from Iowa has a district which is about 96 percent white. You know, that's where there, there's a real desire to build the wall. But you don't hear that from people anywhere along the border, the U.S.-Mexican border or in places, say, like Erie, Pennsylvania, where the only way they've kept their population growing is by being a refugee welcoming place or even in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which has been so much in the news for the tragedies at the packing house there, where most of the workers in the packing houses are the packing house are immigrants and refugees. And the conservative Republican mayor of Sioux, uh, Sioux Falls, Paul Tenhaken, has been leading a sort of Sioux Falls together campaign at odds with the Republican governor of South Dakota saying, we need to protect all our people. That is, is one thing. The other I'll just mention briefly is that at a time over the last five or six years when people were feeling bad about the U.S. as a whole. And if you ask people how they felt about the course of America in general, they thought it was was looking pretty dark. But if you ask them about where they actually lived, and in most regions of the country, most, most ethnic groups, they felt as if their own part of the country was, was on the right track. And so this 
contrast between the world of direct experience and the world of mediated experience was something we wanted to mm. explain. And I think people will value more the kind of um, uh, the kind of contact they, they can have again. Um, we're going to bring a lot of our panel back uh, in a moment. I have a, a question, uh, kind of a broader American question before we do that. Um, this has been an interesting moment for federalism in the sense that states have had to do a lot. States are banding together. You see the West Coast states working together. And, and you know, on some level, you see states doing their own foreign policy in terms of how they're trying to trade and stuff like that. Uh, today, the president said he wanted to withdraw support from the World Health Organization. And I can imagine there are a bunch of governors that are like, we'd like to be with part of the World Health Organization. Do you see, do you see anything kind of in, in kind of the fabric of how we, how we play America and federalism that may shift out of this? Yes. And as, as we all know, there are certain constant themes in American life. And one of them, of course, is the balance between centralism and localism. That was there at the time of the Constitution. It's been there in various ways since. I did a piece for The Atlantic about a year and a half ago uh, saying, let's look again at the Roman Empire. We always worry about whether the U.S. is going to fall like the Roman Empire. Maybe we should just assume that national level U.S. is going to fall. And look what happened to the Roman Empire afterwards and the way that regional alliances arose in, in Europe. And this was based on a book from a Stanford professor about the way all the sort of uh, fertility in creative ways of the, of the post-imperial time in, in, in Europe. And we are, and I talked then about the rise of de facto regionalism in the US. And certainly we're seeing that in the pandemic and environmental ways where uh, the, the Pacific Coast states, which are larger and more, more productive and more populous than, than most European countries, are becoming their own block. You're seeing that in the upper uh, upper uh, Midwest, you know, sort of the Chicago land. You're seeing it in the Northeast. You're seeing it in parts of the South, uh, Texas, and its its borders. So I think we may be finding more oomph for good reasons and for bad reasons in these regional alliances of thinking we'll find ways to work together. That can't solve all problems because certain uh, policies, by definition, are national. Uh, starting with, with immigration, but I think there people feel more traction at the regional level now. And I think this also hits this ongoing theme of both localism or distributed internet technology or blockchain technology or even nature, which is about cells and not a master design, right? We've, we've did local energy for resilience. You want local energy. And, and so I'm just, I'm just wondering if that, if that doesn't become kind of one of the animating themes that comes out of this. Um, I, I, I think so. I hope so. And here is my calculus as somebody who has lived through a lot of the turmoil of American history, including the year 1968, which was worse than 2020 has been so far. On the other hand, it's still May. So we'll yeah. see what, what happens in, in, in 2020. And that is in times of great stress in the United States, which we're going through obviously now, economic stress, social stress, the horrific racial episodes that have been brought to light again in the past um, a week, uh, revealing or emphasizing what's been there for, for, for centuries. The question for the U.S. is always, does this lead us in a better direction or a worse direction? And there are times when the strains of the original Gilded Age led after a, a lot of turmoil to a better time, after the Great Depression, there were, way, there were resources that the country found. So the hope and that uh, is that in business ways and governmental ways in spiritual ways, we, we think what are the new connections we can find with people, with, with localities that make it possible to have a better path after this real trough of all sorts that the country is plunged in right now. And, you know, when you started your book, when you did that original Atlantic article, you quoted, maybe it was Philip Zuccolo, and you said, there is this theme going on just under the surface. We hear notes, but it has to be brought together in a melody. And it sounds like we're back again. We see all this innovation going on. That's all the stuff we've covered in the show. How does that rise up and become part of the story and create hope rather than what we see on the news every night because polarization sells? It's uh, There was an interesting... Um, observation that my Atlantic colleague, Ed Young, who's been doing such phenomenal work on the pandemic Amazing. made yeah. a week or two yeah. ago, he was saying that all the polls indicate that most people by huge majorities are behaving responsibly now. They're staying home, they're doing things they should. 
and a very small minority of people are storming the Capitol in Michigan, carrying AR-15s and doing uh, doing things uh, of that sort, or having these uh, protests of public health officials over the last week or two. And Ed Young pointed out that the things that help a society deal with a pandemic or that build capital of various kinds are not photogenic. It's boring to see somebody uh, sitting at home hmm. and being with his or her family and yeah, people carrying AR-15s to the Capitol is yeah. very photogenic. So there's this yeah. built-in disproportion in uh, in what we see versus the sort of hmm. the, the reality going on. So trying to give some coherence and a sense of a chorus or melody is part of what in our different ways we're, we're all involved in. This photogenic idea, you know, the, the entire 20th century was about the rise of cameras and ways of capturing things, right? In the 18th century, you painted things and then and then modern art went through a change because why should you paint something, a beautiful picture if you could take a picture of it? Um, and this idea that, you, you know, not photogenic, so much of what's happening now, uh, algorithms that actually oppress people, um, a lot of the things even Ashley talked about, which sort of the the things are starting to be able to sh be shaping us, then we don't even, maybe not, we're not aware of them having intelligence and kind of helping you or maybe shaping you in a way you didn't know. Almost all of those are not photogenic because they're happening inside our heads. And until we have a camera for like our, our, our state of mind and our, our being and our feelings and our reflections and our, and our aggregate, it's very hard to, to make that, you know, headline. Uh, well, that's why it's so good we have design experts like all of you thinking about these challenges so you can help Don't us worry. In, in, in envision it. So this is uh, one of your many um, tasks going forward. What a lovely should, bring, yeah, the rest of our let's bring the rest of the crew. Yeah. And, you know, you actually, uh, Jim, you just set up kind of a uh, paradox there, because on the one hand, we can use these great design skills to move forward. On the other hand, here in 2020, um, you know, we have algorithms that, that were built for efficiency or, or for attention in Facebook, which now have created further polarization. So we kind of have the tech, it's it's a design and architecture and value set of decisions that the tech industry needs to make. And we're kind of a young industry and we're led by a lot of young people. And there's a dilemma here. Jeremiah, I would love to get your thoughts on this because, you know, yes. we, everybody that you and I talk to in this industry is now aware of the fact that we have responsibilities we didn't have when we were like kids in this industry. And like, when you listen to these challenges, what's our sense for both how we're doing and even this feud going on right now between Twitter trying to have some editorial sense and Facebook saying, forget about it. So to pick up on Ashley's great points at Microsoft around AI ethics and, and that is a, a top topic that my firm is being asked about and mm. every company becoming a tech company now has to think about the power in which they they wield and to do so responsibly and, and so these these companies their business models were predicated on becoming a platform a marketplace amazon airbnb uber google facebook twitter we just enable the transactions we're not held accountable we just look for the quality for the customer and the shareholder mm. but now we have to think broader about the societal impacts and so all of them uh are thinking about what does this mean? But it's not just them. Um, the retail stores are going to adopt Amazon Go and their other competitors in the space. So this is this is something that is spread far and wide. And I think what's happening right now in society. So let's let's use the metaphor. Uh, my laptop is infected with a horrible virus, and when I restart it, it's still there. It won't go away. I try to remove software. I try to clean it manually. It doesn't work. So what I have to do is I have to reformat the operating system, which is to wipe it clean. And then I can put on the apps. Yes, I probably lost some data or preferences, but I can restart. And we're actually going through that period right now. And we have an opportunity to wipe the slate clean and reformat Earth if we so desire. So that is the opportunity. And by the way, the virus isn't just Corona to the points that James was bringing yeah. up. There are some yeah. societal viruses that are not bacteria. Ashley, you mentioned that, that you know, you're raising these stores and people have to manage those things. So effectively they're workers and they're going to be distributed workers. They just happen to be physical places, whether they're home offices or whether they're in Sioux Falls or whatever. And someone's going to have to actually deal with uh, a, a, a machine learner that has a physical place that got bad training data and put it on probation, just like you have to do that if you end up with a, an employee that has a bad thing. Tell us a little bit about your reaction to what Jim has been talking about and what Jeremiah has been talking about. Uh, such an interesting conversation. I, I find myself um, 
thinking about a few different dimensions of it. Um, and Jeremiah, I don't disagree with you. We have such a remarkable, I mean, what is the the somewhat cavalier statement, but you know, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Um, <clears throat> there, there is, you know, we've drained the swamp. We've seen um, the, the fragility um, and the lack of resiliency in so many of our systems. And we talk a lot about the success of digital. I, I don't know about you guys, but I actually find many aspects of the digital experience that I am limited to quite unsatisfying. Um, I am I'm about zoomed out, um, you know, present company, absolutely accepted. Um, and I find myself potentially more exhausted at the end of the day than than I had been if I was running around, you know, all over town. Um, pixels under glass are a poor substitution for human engagement. Um, you know, as a creative practitioner, um, one of the things that like I know it's a really great meeting if I end up sitting on the floor. Um, because I have I have lost wow. all sense of physicality and I am simply gelling with the people I'm speaking to. And that's like, we don't call it chemistry in the room for nothing. It actually is chemistry. There are pheromones. Um, there is something that happens when people are in close proximity that can't... <laughs> I, I'm, I hesitate to say can't yet be created um, because I, <clears throat> I suspect yeah. that we could probably figure out a way to do it digitally. But all that by way of saying, I think we're going to have to get really thoughtful about what kind of invention needs to happen both physically and digitally. And it doesn't mean mm -hmm. just where they come together, but what they are individually. Um, kind of reflecting back on the, the workplace conversation, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's fascinating um, to think about the, the access to, um, I'll call it higher employment. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get a little over my skis here, but as, as I was listening to us speak, I was thinking about the GI bill, you know, which was such a profound influence on American culture because it gave people access to education. Um, I'm wondering if we're actually looking at something similar in terms of access to, to higher employment, um, or to, <clears throat> to, um, kind of more knowledge worker, um, access. And could mm. we, could we be as thoughtful about this as a cultural shift as, as the individual that perhaps didn't even know what they were actively doing um, back in that point in time, but it, it profoundly changed. And I think in many ways improved American culture. I hope that same thing um, for us now. But um, my, my suspicion is we're going to be looking at really getting very clear on um, what digital is good for and what physical is good for and being much more methodical mm. about it. Um, Some of what is native or authentic and digital? Don't give that up because we, we live in, I, there are biophilic design patterns. There was a 10 year study in Chicago with Chicago school kids. They, they actually just took paved over playgrounds for, that had been paved over for years in public schools and <laughs> turned them back into little places with, with grass and with trees. And over 10 years controlling for every neighborhood in Chicago, the scientist was able to demonstrate incredible uptick in, in test scores because they walked outside because the, the trees have not pheromones, but they have something because we've we've been with them for a long time. Reduction in health problems and things like that. Mm -hmm. And and we're not saying that as, okay, yeah, you're gonna give me a thousand bucks for a package <laughs> to like upgrade my thing. That has nothing to do with like three months from now. That has nothing to do with like us walking in the park together as a team and bonding and having the trees actually help us bond and helping, you know, all those things that we we thrive on. So I, you know, I just um, I'm excited by you saying that because I think we've got to we've got to remember this stuff. There's an um, interesting segue to Jeremiah yeah. here. Jeremiah, before we had all this conversation about COVID in cities, you were early on really focusing on wellness uh, and wellness yeah. technology as a key part oh. of tech coverage. And one of the things we learned as we all went highly virtual in the last couple of months, as we've said here before, we all felt like a brain in a jar. We used, you know, when we use Zoom to connect, we did these physical connections, we kind of like went nuts. And um, uh, and, and this, this is, and to your point, Mickey, this also points out that that as we, as we build more of this technology, we're losing something. And then how do we use technology to either monitor it or bring it back? And I'd love your thoughts on kind of what you're hearing from clients on that and how tech helps ground us again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, there's, it's interesting The tech companies that I'm working with are focused on emotions and empathy um, mm. in even the software products that they would build. And this is not native to them at all. And I'm actually surveying mm. um, 
uh, you, with, I'm partnered with Ring Central, which enables telecommunications among teams. And mm. we're doing a survey on emotions of workers and, and to figure out, mm. do they feel more lonely or connected using digital technologies? And, and when should you work together and collaborate? And when should you work yeah. um, apart? And, and, to, and Mickey, you were talking about the patterns. Look for, there's, it depends on what is the task at, at hand. Um, and then, of course, Nicole Bradford's on the, watching the stream. I see her in the Facebook. She is the expert when it comes to trans tech. So she's uh, many of our mutual friends. Uh, so she knows how the mind and, and transcendence and self-actualization self is becoming analyzed, digitized, amplified through technology. And, and so that's a whole movement amongst itself that is now moving into companies. What's mm. interesting is most of these companies have launched HR departments have launched well employee well-being programs, but they weren't mm. ready for COVID. So this is something new to them. So it, mm. it is something I'm seeing from the product side of companies, from the HR departments. It, it is really a topic that is emerging as the mind, emotions, and mood. Um, hey, uh, Jim, what do you think in terms of this notion of the hub and spoke model that Jeremiah talked about and the infusion of the spokes into places that, you know, it might be an employee who always wanted to go back to Sioux Falls or something, but they happen to be in San Francisco or whatever. What do you think that'll do to the to the local kind of community and how might that help or hinder? Or what, what do you see, what's your instinct on this? So even in the before times, we saw a number of examples of that, of people who had worked in San Francisco and decided they really wanted to be, I'm thinking a specific case back in Fort Wayne, Indiana, or in Duluth mm. or, or yeah. other places. And I think we'll see an acceleration of that while we still see the biggest cities playing a role. You were mentioning earlier the downtown real estate issue. I think that's a serious one. I would not personally want to be in commercial real estate at this moment, but I think mm. we'll see probably an increase in the people who have seen the world and feel as if uh, the next place they can be with their children, with their family, uh, with, with scale is a, a smaller city. I wonder if, as I do with Peter, I could answer a different question. <laughs> no, which yeah, of course. Is what both uh, Jeremiah and Ashley were saying, which was this idea of responsibility from the tech industry. And I think it's mm -hmm. important to recognize there's been no technology in human history that has ever been purely good. For every invention there's been, it's had both destructive and constructive uh, implications. We're talking about chemicals, which both um, cure people and poison people, and and mm -hmm. aviation, which was you know for transport and 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 warfare, and you can anything on the list you can can find out. And there is a, I think we have been, we need more refinement on what are the conditions in which all of the confluence of digital technology now can have more of its beneficial applications and fewer of the harmful ones. And I think one one uh, thing we see, and I, I'd say in particular, the Microsoft versus Facebook contrast is maturity, both of the company and the people running it. And Microsoft is a relatively mature company now. Facebook is not, and also there are corporate governance issues which I think mean, mean uh, different things in the behavior of those companies. The other well, is- You might have even reported on uh, the Microsoft antitrust stuff back when that was like a big deal and, and yes. Congress every day. And like, we can't even remember that far back, but oh, it, they, had it, to, it, it, they had to it, shift. And that's, that's the other point. A lot of today's digital economy was made possible by the Microsoft antitrust case. And so yeah. there are times when the government says, all right, we need to set certain standards here. So I think and both corporate yeah. maturity and federal mm. policy or state policy have a role. It's worth uh, by the way, just I noticed that, that uh, 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 Sir Yavanka, who used to used to um, lead some design at Microsoft, a uh, friend is, is watching this as well. I think they started committing to this idea of not being the know-it-alls, um, yeah. particularly when Satya Nadella took over. Yep. Um, uh, more recently, and instead be the learn it alls, and they really embrace Carol Dweck's, you know, kind of open mindsets, the idea of growth mindsets, and I've seen it in person, like a difference at this place yes. that I used to think of as the evil empire, is is pretty different now, and I think that that goes to your maturity model, this notion that how do we learn as fast as we can, you know, mm -hmm. how do we really grow from this, not just, you know, keep hitting our head against the wall and expecting a different response. And and that just feels very exciting. Uh, and I it's think, interesting um, to how flag, when that trust case happened, Microsoft was not a mature company then, right? <laughs> it got it got hit with that and Gates's response was to be a bully. 
And by the way, that whole thing itself came about because there was a ballot initiative in California during the first internet bubble that was going to basically allow people to sue companies where their stock went up and down. It's called the Lorac Initiative. And that got John Doerr and Apple and Oracle and a whole bunch of people organized to defeat it. And once that was over, all these Silicon Valley companies were organized and they were wondering, we're organized, what do we do next? And they came up with a plan to go after Microsoft, which had no immune system, wasn't mature and got blindsided and then eventually became mature. Fast yeah. forward today and we see this, this characterization of the difference. Also watching the show today is Charlie Firestone, who led the Communications mm -hmm. Society program at the Aspen Institute. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. <laughs> Hi, Charlie. Okay, but this, <laughs> this issue of how you actually bring in thoughtful ethics in this tech conversation. For example, in America, we love liberty. Everybody loves the First Amendment. I can say whatever I want. And, you know, that's kind of the whole uh, Zuckerberg thing. We can do whatever we want. And it's almost heretical to say, well, no, we can't have every conversation. Mm -hmm. But the other side of liberty is responsibility. We don't know that as well. And so I think one of the interesting questions is where and how do we do it, introduce this conversation um, among young people and among tech people? Because, you know, we are everything we're doing is kind of governance these days. And, and for me, just to pile in there for a second, I think there are, so I've spent most of my working life as a, as a magazine writer, as a journalist. And from, even though journalists have never been beloved by, by the public, wherever they are, you are taught early on in this business that there is, there is power and there's responsibility. You know, all the big sort of theorists of the press say, you have rights, but you need to think about how they can be misused, et cetera. My father was a small town mm. doctor after being a Navy mm. doctor. Obviously the medical profession has taught about its balance of responsibilities. I think the tech mm. world has been slow to recognize mm. that it too needs to have that professional formation of these are tools that can be used as they say for good or evil. And you need yeah. to think about, about both, both sides of that equation. I want to point out something that I think is interesting. Um, back when we were writing Trillions and doing the research for sort of how would you have a trillion node world, which we're kind of moving towards with what Ashley's working on, um, you actually look for what uh, communities of practice look like when you have to do, take something very powerful and build kind of the building code or the electric code or the plumbing code. And it turns out that's a Bible. I mean, it's treated like the Bible, like you do not go against this code. And when we were researching this, we looked at it and we were like, wait, we are like 60, 70 depends on your counting 20 um, years into this tech revolution. And there's no code for how you manage, install, and maintain complexity at all. We just have geek squads in the hopes that maybe enough geek squads in the world could fix us or our children could figure out and be our IT managers when we can't figure out our, how to reboot our drives. And, and yet, um, you know, the plumbing code is a very simple example. There are no sinks that can be installed anywhere in the world with the faucet below the level of the sink. Why? Because it turns out in small towns a long time ago, if you had dirty water and the faucet went below it, it could sump it in and, and poison the water well and people died. No circuit breakers are allowed to be in your bottom, in your basement, in your house, closer than a meter from a wall. Because if you touch the electricity, you bounce off the wall, you bounce back into the electricity, you bounce back off the wall and you set up a, 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 a crazy loop. It's just built into the code. It is part of the Bible of... Uh, hard lessons of so we're seeing some of that for the first time we're seeing apple hmm. and google working together on a standard during a point of crisis right, yeah. right with the contact tracing app like that was a pretty big milestone to see those two hmm. arch enemies saying we will collaborate to hit almost 99 percent of all phones to track this hmm. virus yeah it, obviously the adoption hasn't really fully launched yet but but the point is that they made that choice during crises that is a signal that we can reformat society. Mm. That is the opportunity. Well, and um, Mohib just mentioned that, that this policy, this idea is called the bus policy. If you, hit, if you get hit by a bus tomorrow, will anybody else know how to maintain that damn thing? <laughs> and, and I think that that's a, that's a good, he works at, uh, at Amazon. Um, and, I think, and I think it's an important comment. Um, I think you're right about this contract, particularly the privacy preserving contact tracing stuff. Where, where the phones are all generating random numbers and just looking at if you were around somebody else who generated that random number uh, when that infection hit, right? There are very subtle um, sort of cyber things that can be applied to this in terms of protection. Um, we are at 525. I know a few people have to head out at 530. As always, this has been an hour 
that that seems like it went in five minutes and probably took an hour and a half. Um, but any last words or, or comments, just reactions to this notion of, you know, will we have Zoom towns? Will we have boom towns? Will we have something else? What are the kinds of things you're you're thinking about uh, on a positive note, on a, on a sort of possibilities of what Jeremiah and Ashley and, and, and James sure, have all I'll, mentioned? Sure, I'll, I'll take that first. Um, mm. And Peter shared an article with me prior about the types of people that will leave cities. Mm. And that's something we haven't fully addressed. And in that article, maybe you could surface mm. that, Peter, it, it pointed out that younger folks are more likely mm. to stay in the urban environment because there's the excitement, they don't mm. have dependence, mm. they don't have to grow into a family. And I'd also, uh, those that have families, I do, I'm more likely to live in the suburbs. I do live in the suburbs. Oh, by mm. the way, I don't, I don't live in this trailer. I actually have a house. Uh, yeah. But the, the, the point is but that I love we, the trailer. thank you. But we might also see minorities be more comfortable around each other. For me, it's a non-starter to go to um, a city or a region or a small town that does not have other people that share my same culture and the way I look mm. and the values and the food. Mm. Um, that is mm. important to me. So we may see some of that impact who is actually um, shifting about in the planet. I think also maybe age, right? Because one of the things I heard from someone who does a lot of research with people who retire, we're living longer, except for this COVID virus in general. And uh, a lot of people that were the baby boom generation, the hippies, the whatever, they don't really want to retire. They were sold a bill, you know, this great idea of retirement, but they're living longer. And they're like, actually, I want my third chapter. I want, I want something new. I want to learn something new. And I'm, I'm starting to, one of the things I heard was that large houses lead to small lives. These McMansions, when you're older, you end up never leaving and you end up never having, you get social isolation. You, you never have a connection. Whereas small houses lead to big lives. And this is, this is a, something that some doctors and researchers in the, in the sort of emerging blue zones uh, for, for sort of rebooting what it means to have a third or fourth chapter are talking about. And they, they really wanna engage with the youth because they, ha they wanna fall in love they just, they've already lost some loved ones, but it's not like we were different humans at the age of 65 or 70. You know, they want to find out something new. They want to have a social connection. Um, Aisha Bursell, who's an amazing designer in New York who wrote Design the Life You Love, um, recently lo helped launch um, a VC startup, uh, a sort of incubator that actually pairs 20 something startups with 60, 70, 55 year olds and says, actually, you know, life is great when you get older, Design sucks for them. And, and how do we actually kind of evolve this situation? So it might be the cities are actually, you know, 20 somethings and 55 and 70 year olds having a great time in, in this thing. And then, you know, when you're in the middle of your life, you know, go hide away. Go, Just one go, uh, you know. uh, Jeremiah, the, that was Riaz's article, which we posted in the chat here. He's mm -hmm. a real estate developer in Oakland. And his mm -hmm. point was, there are people who are young in their career who have to make these connections to get started. And then at some point when you're older and you've had kids, not so much, he's trying to project on that. And we'll publish a resource guide with a lot of this. Jim, I know you have to leave us at the so, bottom of the hour. Uh, yeah, so I will- question we asked with a different answer, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I will actually um, answer the, 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 or at least address the question you asked about um, you know the the shape of, of, of these cities saying I, I had not heard that sort of um, big house small lives uh, mantra but that rings true and also true to what mm. Deb and I saw where the growth in cities was people in their 20s and people in their 60s and above you know coming coming down mm. I, I will say that something we learned by flying at low altitude around the country is you can see how the settlement patterns of the US were so affected by the technology of different eras when mm. water wheel power came in there were settlements along you know along yeah. the the fall line yeah. in the east and 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 uh streetcars you know of course there were the settlement patterns the big eastern cities and the car of course as the big uh, driver mm -hmm. of the last so to speak last 70 or 80 years and i think that the technologies we're talking about probably will see their imprint um in the next wave of development mm -hmm. of where the growth is whether whether it's more downtown or other places but technology has affected our settlement patterns and i, I believe we're in one of those those uh, mm. processes now. Jim, I have a final question for you mm. and you can answer this or answer anything. <laughs> but about 44 years ago, you went to work for President Carter and you helped shape what we were saying as we're heading into the bicentennial. Um, if you were chosen to help craft what the next president might say or what we might say going into this race, kind of as a framing thing or a vision or kind of like how we want to put all this together, 
kind of what might you advise? So going into this race, if we're talking about this political season, the simple argument I would make is we are better than this. Yeah. This is mm. that that is, I think, the essential argument to mm. make. And a version of that is essentially what all leaders in, of the U.S. history and most other countries have said, essentially saying, recognizing trauma, hardship, heartbreak and sin of individuals and of a nation. So feeling the loss that people are experiencing right now in an acute way having confidence of the direction in which it is possible to go, you know, that we've been through hard times before individually and as a nation, mm. we recognize that dealing with it, that learning from our challenges is the way to become better and then having a plan. So mm. empathy, confidence, and a plan. That is sort of, <laughs> with those, those three elements, uh, you can go far. Nice. Tim, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, thanks. So greetings from, from DC. It's been an honor to be with you. Ashley, we want to get your your final thoughts. Uh, oh, my goodness. Um, <clears throat> I I was noticing in, in one of the, the live comments, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't presume that physical is better than digital. Um, um, and I absolutely agree. I, I think it's I think it's yeah. a matter of getting really purposeful um, about what that division looks mm -hmm. like. And and quite frankly, um, I'm anxious for a, a little bit crisper data around that. So I'd actually like to see yeah. more technology brought to bear on understanding um, that problem space. Like the interfaces between digital and physical. Yeah, what, what would authentic and native be? Do it well if it's digital, do it well if it's physical, but actually with people at the center, not with, hey, look, I made a cool hammer. Let's turn everything into nails. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah, um, good point. <laughs> One of the conversations that we were having, um, if, if I have just a couple of seconds, and um, Jeremiah, I agree with you, I think it's going to be a very individualized um, sort of cocktail mm. of what right looks like. Yeah. Um, and and a lot of it, I think, has to do not necessarily with with where, but with what and who. Um, you know, the the complexity of information, is it is it something that I am better suited to do individually or do I frankly need other people to do it? Yeah. And what are my personal preferences? Because, you know, I think a lot of us are talking about having the home office, you know, for many of my colleagues, that's not, that's not an answer. They've got small children. Um, this is a fascinating conversation when you change it to a school context um, where learning is best performed. Mm -hmm. And to me, all of this is sort of mixed up together. You know, from a retail perspective, I can't eat a hamburger virtually. Um, there, there are still experiences um, and there's still significant yeah. portions of the economy that will never be able to fully digitally be realized. Um, and even if you imagine your your richest sort of metaverse um, future scape, it, it's still, I don't think, going to be as, as um as good as the real thing, um, <clears throat> so I'm anxious to figure out how we how we think about this and how we start to mm. make decisions about where to where to frankly um, put the remarkable creative energy that that is popping mm. out all over. Because um, you know conversations like this, I think, um, are happening much more frequently, obviously, than they ever mm. have. Um, and inviting different voices into those conversations so that again we're not mm -hmm. we're not inadvertently creating very narrow solutions because our perspective hasn't been well informed um, I think is a you know again back to the you're making me think about this notion of uh, just uh, even at, with the Amazon go thing you blended digital and physical there are things you got to do in physical there are things hey you've already got this thing it's called a f an app on your phone don't reinvent that you, your team didn't go we're gonna make a, an app. You just said, actually, no, Amazon spent a lot of time, Whole Foods, Amazon, all those people spent a lot of time on this. Let's actually just blend for what works well and That's respect right. those. But I think what you focused on was the places in between too, mm -hmm. it feels like. And maybe how do we have conversations be about how do you design the experience intentionally between the physical and the digital? How do you, how do you sort of understand context? Because I think Jeremiah and others have, have talked about how context matters so much in this whole thing, but we have to focus on this kind of weird thing that's intangible, which is the arrow going from digital to physical and a different arrow going from physical to digital and and, and an arrow going into the one where they're both, you know, they're mixed. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, you know what Peter, I think about this? What now? What now? Okay, let's, let's <laughs> I just put that here. So here's a fascinating thing. We convened this to talk about a sense of place. We started in this dichotomy between are we going to be online? Are we going to go home? Are we going to go to other places? 
And, and as we got into it, we started getting into the responsibility of the online world and that it had a governance responsibility much as the real world has. And we've kind of come back to this notion of the role of cyberspace in the real world. And kind of where we've ended up is all of this stuff that we do in the digital domain has to be in jazz or in concert or in relationship to the physical domain and to the rules. And this reminds me of, um, this is how America works, right? It's the messy pluralism of America that gets us through and the reconciliation of ideas. And, you know, we were talking about, Jeremiah, kind of what it was like early on in the tech industry when perhaps we were less mature. One of the founding documents in that era, and I'll just read a line from it now because it's kind of stunning in light of today. Is it was, a clue train? What? Is I'm it actually, clue train? That's great. We'll do a show on clue train. We should just do a clue train anniversary. I was going to go back to John Perry Barlow, uh. the Declaration of Independence in Cyberspace, 1996. This came out of a reaction to the Telecommunications Act. But this is what he said. Talk about a community that was a bit insular and, you know, kind of... Um, uh, I don't know, you know, the survivalists off on their own. Barlow writes, governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel. I come from cyberspace, the new home of the mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you to leave the past, ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. Okay. Oh. <laughs> that sounds like a tech bubble. <laughs> No, it's adorable, right? It's it's. Didn't he travel with the Grateful Dead for a while, though? I mean, he understood that. But look, it, it, it all gets to what we were talking about with um, with James, which is the deep American in you know instinct towards liberty and and expression, right? But also the fact that you have to have this contentious stuff with everyone else, and and so this conversation here in the middle of COVID, where we actually are in the middle of. What you know is this a slippery slope to 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 surveillance and we're taking our temperatures and the, the retail environments we pick it up and put it back and those who we are, uh, the these governance issues are front and center in, in our and and we're actually arguing you know the governance of cyberspace in the presidential election as recently as this morning with the president and Zuckerberg yelling at each other. So what I take out of this is that it's, I think it's the it, president and Jack yelling at each other, but who knows? Yeah. I mean, it's all of them. I, you know, Peter, before you go too much further, and I know you're rapping, which is good because we just, this is corn time. Um, but um, you keep saying America is at, its, at its best and America is at its best and all that. And frankly, society is at its best. And America for a very long time had been an engine and a period of time and a moment and helped us. And I think the rest of the world is yearning for America to wake back up again. Um, but but we, we as humans are at our best, wherever we live, wherever we find it, where we can actually get together in a collective and actually kind of strive and try to thrive and not just, not just survive, but really get over that and thrive. And I, I think we have to just remember this, um, you know, for so long we almost could rest on our laurels as an American, you know, that, well, look at look what we did. We, we've done a lot of cool stuff, you know, um, but I think the rest of the world's like, mm, yeah, but not so much. I mean, thank you, but it's it's rough. It's rough out there. And I and I love. I'm an American deeply, um, but uh, uh, I also love the world and I love everybody. And I feel like we have to just keep that in mind. I know you think that too, Peter and uh, uh, Jim, and uh, and his wife uh, were bureau chiefs in Beijing, and I, and and her book about learning Mandarin is brilliant and um even in his book uh, their book about our towns they relate second second tier cities in china and asia to second tier cities in america because they were there too mm -hmm. and i think we have to kind of remember that when you get down to that level it's stunning and amazing because humans are amazing and and we are better than this which goes back to you know quoting jim um and and i think that's the big opportunity here is that we the collective are better than this when machines help amplify the things that we all have as brokennesses inside, it doesn't let us show the better, you know, the better angels of our nature. Um, so I just want to clarify that too, because I know Peter, you believe this too. It's just you, America is the rallying cry for this. Well, we're local, and this is where well, we are. Yeah, I think there's two points here. One is within the container um, ca called America. We're, we're having a set of fights and things now. And I just, it was just kind of like interesting kind of where we're at. I think on the international thing, um, 
I think the world is a little bit telling us to buck up. Like there's certain things you do well, like not kill the World Health Organization or you're collaborating with us and you do trade. So if you just get back in the damn horse and like move forward yeah. a little. So there's a certain expect responsibility. And but it's also true that um, how do you reformat to use your term, Jeremiah, globalism, right? Gl globalism probably won't be as extractive and it won't be all products flying all over the place. As, as we discussed last time, there's thriving local resilient economies inside of a global context is a thing. This is an architecture thing. I was actually thinking, Jeremiah, maybe it's yes. not how spoke. Maybe it's highly distributed self-organizing. You know, it looks like distributed objects as opposed to mm -hmm. like a honeycomb. Main, huh? yeah, yeah, honeycomb right. model. Mm. Right. That's a hive right. model, right? And it's evenly distributed. There's a lot to be discussed yeah. on honeycomb right. yeah. structure yeah. and how that all works. But yes, it is a yeah. model we can we can emulate. And and technically the internet is the honeycomb model in a way too, because every home now is interconnected. Each cell should be able to contain the sweet nectar that they should all have it evenly in theory now. We don't need the, the massive hub. Hmm. Yes. And that 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 kind of brings us, Mickey, to to where we're headed, and this concept that um, there are a bunch of ideas that are bouncing around that need to reflect and be connected up, and that might be a great cue for you to remind us of our design challenge and our mirror board, yes. which is our attempt to connect those things up. You're on. Definitely. Well, thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Jeremiah. Um, thanks for joining us. And um, this was just. Yeah, my brain is buzzing, so I really appreciate it. No, there's a lot to be continued here. This, 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 Jeremiah, you and I kind of got caught up this week, and there's just a lot that that we can continue on this. All of these conversations are kind of like the beginning of something, and 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 I think that what we'd like this show and property to become is part of kind of a global collaboration movement, or or part of a you know how how do people work together around the world to kind of share ideas and amplify things, and and uh, you know play our part in part of that distributed network. Thank you for having me. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Mickey. All right, I will explain uh, our challenge. So if you're watching, viewers, now's your chance to actually um, be an archaeologist. So um, if we can pull up the, the whiteboard for a second, I'd appreciate it. So I've been trying to capture today's episode. I didn't do a very good job. There's a hub and spoke model over there with a with a, a, a sort of an, a thing and some other stuff over there and this balance between centralism and uh, regionalism. But um, you guys can help us with this, all of us, you men, women, children, uh, everybody can help. And here's the challenge. So this week's challenge is called Weak Signal Archaeology. And what we'd like you to do, and it'll take five minutes, 10 minutes, um, or you can binge make, and you can actually be like sort of the lone archaeologist that discovers a nugget that might help us in the future. Um, so the instructions are here. Uh, the mural board is linked on our site. You can click on it, go right in and read the instructions. It'll show up here. The, the goal here is to discover a weak signal in, in, the, in the entire first season's episodes of Quarantine. So we've got until next Wednesday um, and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, maybe you go to one of the episodes and I'll, I'll just scroll through some episodes. Oh, here's one. Um, I'm interested in this, this area over here. Uh, this is when Ting Jiaeng um, and, uh, uh, and some of other our guests were talking about how play was a powerful way to change your behavior, not just motivation, but how do you actually build new habits. And, um, and one of our uh, commenters, viewers, joined us and said, here's this week's signal. Um, and they, they just filled in this post-it note. All they did was click on it and typed in some stuff. What is the week signal that you see here that maybe nobody else did or that surprised you of this episode? Um, and you can go back and watch the episode or scroll through it quickly to see why does it matter for the future if we're going to actually be better than this and grow? And and what's this? Why is it weak? Why is how come nobody else is seeing it? Why do you think it's being drowned out by all the noise? And then bonus, you know, draw a picture, diagram or a, write a haiku. So all you need to do is find one episode that has a blank post-it. There are, are three post-its per episode um, and fill them in. And, uh, and you're done. And then in the next challenge, we're going to try to do what's called silent sort. So this is a design methodology that says, go be an archaeologist. And then we're going to do silent sort with a whole bunch of, of our viewers and, and our guests and try to figure out how these group together into powerful enablers that might help us start co-creating something for the future. Thanks, Mick. It, 
it, it is amazing how um, much innovation and positive energy and possibility we can find in both the middle of this and the middle of a really difficult week, uh, kind of on many fronts here in America. But it, it, it always feels like when, when, when you start looking at how people are working on tomorrow and how we're inspired by the problems we're facing, uh, it, it's a great time of movement and, and, and mm. charge for all of us to go do things. And also time for us to go celebrate the fact that it's Friday night at 545 on the West coast and it's time to move on. Um, it, uh, next week, um, we're still working on next week. I think we're going to do, um, one interesting show, uh, kind of looking at additional forms of placemaking next week and, and coming up soon in the next week or two, some people doing really interesting things in real estate and adaptive temporary structures that may provide a landing pad for things like restaurants that don't can't afford to be permanent, but should be pop-up. What if you built hmm. structures that could allow that stuff to happen at scale or, or um, uh, kind of a platform for these things to happen because the restaurant business will be transforming a little bit. Um, so we, we've we, also got some scientists and and uh, innovators and and people from the foundation world that have been looking at population health and how we can actually kind of help move a whole population into a better state. And so yeah, we've got some little things percolating right now. Come on back. I do think Wednesday next Wednesday um, I want to review what people came up with for archaeology. So at least a little bit. You've gotten so Wednesday, it'll take you five minutes, 10 minutes, five hours, three days. It'll take you however long you feel like binging on making things. Because this entire time is Blur's Day because we're, a lot of us are still at home, but we all have to get out this weekend. In San Francisco, we're told we have to be now 30 feet apart if we're working out. Masks, I think, for joggers now, finally. Uh, that's a huge innovation opportunity, by the way. Maybe some kind of exhaust thing and some fun. People could be making cool products right now. By the way, and, and we'll just wrap up on this. Um, I posted over the weekend that I ran from uh, Chrissy Field to Baker Beach, half with the mask on, half with it off. I felt no different. Didn't think with heart rate change. And then a friend of mine who is a trainer and she instruments all of her clients are like, no, mm. this is really bad. So there's actually a whole lot of data underlying the whole health thing. We barely got into it today. You gave me something yesterday. Mm -hmm. Why Things, which is an Internet of Things company, I was figuring yeah. everybody's at home, they're getting fat, they're not working out, it sucks. You were actually showing the data that according to like all these Internet of Things devices. With Things, yeah. They're, and they're a pretty open platform. I think um, uh, blood pressure cuff, blood ox uh, things, but you just put them in your house, the scale and things like that. But yeah, they, they're able to tap into that and they uh, will we'll share it on our site. Uh, some yeah. interesting data on people aren't necessarily losing or gaining weight. Um, they're moving around, uh, but we, you know, that doesn't mean we're necessarily in great shape. I need to move around more. So, but I'll be yeah. out this weekend with the camera, figuring out if people are heavy or not, and we'll get back to you that next week. I don't yeah, think we have any more to say. No. Um, I want to thank you, Mickey, and I want to also thank our amazing guests, uh, Ashley, uh, Jim Fallows, uh, and Jeremiah, for this amazing tour from uh, looking at, 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 at space and boom towns and zoom towns and on governance. It's now 548 Pacific quarantine. Hold on. I want to make sure we also don't do this without Mohib and oh, Mohib. who are distributed out in the world, helping us with uh, all the technical stuff and also just uh, keeping our heads on straight in terms of what's even possible in these times. Thanks yeah, guys. We've learned a lot about how to put something like this together. See you at the 22nd show. We're now officially a grown up, so we can go have a drink after the 21st show. So it's now 549 Pacific Quarantine. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. Let's get close, but not so close. To see each other, you love to stay in your quarantine space while we talk.